Income Tax 2023-2024. Electing the Section 179 deduction, how much can you deduct? Get ready and some coffee so we can lessen the sting from the IRS smack with Income Tax Preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in Publication 94. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because... Apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Or six, how to depreciate property, section 179 deduction, special depreciation allowance, makers, listed property, and more tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, remember in the first half of the tax formula is basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The Schedule C rolling into line one income, noting the Schedule C itself also an income statement, basically having business income minus business expenses, which could be called business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which rolls from the Schedule C into line one income of the income tax formula, basically outlining the formula of the 1040, of which this is the first page, Schedule C, ultimately rolling into line number eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one additional income schedule c rolling into line number three business income this is the schedule c profit or loss from business having an income statement format income minus expenses focusing in on the expenses which usually has the largest categories some expenses being more difficult than others, such as depreciation, where, as we saw in prior presentation, even if on a cash basis, we're going to typically have to do an accrual thing, put the depreciable property on the books as an asset, which could be hard because we don't have a balance sheet here with the Schedule C, but we do have depreciation schedules that we can use to track the asset, allocating the expense over the useful life. That's the general rule. And doing that, we'd be using a maker's depreciation, which is similar to a double declining balance situation. But we can also think about these accelerated functions or code sections such as 179, which basically allows us to depreciate most, if not all of the thing or the item, the depreciable property in the current year, which leads to the question of, well, why don't you just let me expense it on a cash basis in the first place? And the reason is, of course, because the tax law changes over time and they're supposed to increase and decrease things like the 179 deduction to stimulate the economy and not to stimulate the economy and so on. But it's not popular to remove it. So we get kind of stuck with it. And that's where we are at this point in time. So we're looking at the 179 deduction, which will al allow us possibly to deduct more up front and then we'll co cover possibly special depreciation, and then the makers, which is the normal depreciation process that we would depreciate using like a double declining balance method more similar to a normal accounting process. All right, how much can we deduct? We're talking 179 deduction. Your 179 deduction is generally the cost of the qualifying property. However, the total amount you can elect to deduct under section 179 is subject to a dollar limit and a business income limit. So if we elect the 179, first note, it's an election. So we could elect not to elect it, right? When <laughs> we could not elect it, uh, why would we do that? Well, sometimes it might be the case where you might think that future years, you're going to generate more revenue and therefore be in a higher tax bracket than the current year. 
So you could have an exception to the general rule in that case of not wanting to take the 179 all in the current year. But usually we would like to take the deduction sooner rather than later because of the time value of money. So the general rule is that we would want to take the 179 deduction if and when we can. So these limits apply to each taxpayer, not to each business. However, see married individuals under dollar limits later. So in other words, these limits are applied to generally the business that we're looking at. Uh, but if you're a married couple, it gets a little bit messy because you have a situation where the two, the two people are, have one taxable entity and you could have situations where you have the business, for example, owned by two married couples and common law situations as to whether or not you can still report it on the Schedule C or whether or not you have to do like a partnership uh, situation in those cases. So there's, you can see why that can get a little bit messy in some cases. For a passenger automobile, the total Section 179 uh, deduction and depreciation deducted are limited. So whenever we talk about cars, the, the deductions, including these accelerated deductions, you can see why the IRS might want to limit them because, again, you can imagine that guy that has the $300,000 car that he's cruising on the strand with and saying that that's going to be a business deduction, which, again, he might be getting clients that way, you know, or something. So maybe that's part of the thing. But the IRS, you can see why it might be skeptical when they're thinking that the car is being used to drive from point A to point B, you know, and there. So see, uh, do the passenger automobiles limit apply in chapter five? So if you deduct only part of the cost of qualifying property as a section 179 deduction, you can generally depreciate the cost you do not deduct. So in other words, if you don't, if you buy the car or if you buy something, $10,000 piece of equipment up front, then can you depreciate more of it up front in a 179 election? If you get like part of the election, let's say for whatever reason, you've got 6,000 that you can depreciate of the property up front, then the remaining 4,000, if you can't get it up front on the 179 deduction, you still get the benefit from it, but not in year one. Rather, you have to apply the normal depreciation rules, depreciating it over the life of the property, most likely using maker's depreciation for that remainder, which is usually a form of double declining balance with a half year convention. So trade in of other property. If you buy qualified property with cash and a trade in, its cost for purpose of section 179 deduction includes only the cash paid. So it gets a little bit messy and this commonly could happen with like cars, for example. You're buying the new car and you have a trade in situation as part uh, of the cost. So once again, if you buy a qualified property with cash and a trade in its cost for purposes of the section 179 deduction includes only the cash you paid. So example, uh, silver leaf, a retail bakery traded in two ovens, having a total adjusted basis of $680 for a new oven costing $1,320. They received a 800 trade in allowance for the old ovens and paid $520 in cash for the new oven. So on the date the silver leaf traded the two old ovens for the new oven, the old ovens and the new oven are classified as real property under uh, the law of the state in which the old and new ovens are located. And as a result, the old and new ovens are real property for purposes of section uh, 1031. So 1031 uh, exchange kind of situation. So the new oven is section 179 property. Only the portion of the new oven's base uh, basis paid by cash qualifying for the Section 179 deduction. Uh, therefore, Silver Leaf's qualifying cost for the Section 179 deduction is 520. So that gets to be somewhat of a complicated situation, uh, in part due because if we have a trade-in situation, if it's a 1031 uh, trade, then we have this situation of the basis being allocated over. And so I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail on the 1031 accounting for it. It's a whole nother kind of thing in and of itself, which is an interesting topic. Maybe we'll do a course or section on it, but uh, that's kind of the idea. The basis is going to pull over uh, and that's going to complicate things like the 179 deduction.
dollar limits. So the total amount you can elect to deduct under section 179 for most property placed in service in tax years beginning in 2023 generally cannot be more than 1,160,000. So these limitations can seem a little bit, they're clearly very arbitrary. And this is one of the problems that we have uh, when, when we're dealing with these, these kind of blanket tax laws that they change uh, from year to year because obviously they're going to favor some businesses in some locations over some other businesses and locations given the fact that some businesses require more capital invest investment versus other businesses uh, uh, that do not. And uh, from state and location to state and location, some things are going to be costing more, especially when you're talking about certain types of like real estate property, for example, but everything might be costing differently uh, in different locations. So it obviously it depends on the size of the business as to how substantial that number that number is with regards to purchases of things like property, plant and equipment. So if you acquire and place and service more than one item of qualifying property during the year, you can elect the Section 179 deduction among the items in any way, as long as the total deduction is not more than 1,160,000. Now that seems fairly straightforward, but it can actually be quite confusing and could lead to some tax planning situations. So in other words, like to get to this 1,160, you might not have one piece of property that costs like $2 million or whatever, and you max out the 179 at 1,160 and the rest you depreciate using makers. It might be that you have, you know, 10 pieces of property that go over the 1,160. Then the question is, which of those properties should you make the election for to hit that cap? And it might depend on the fact that you might have depreci different depreciable lifetimes for the different property. In other words, they all qualify for 179 deduction, but some of the property, if you were to use the maker's lives, are seven year versus three year versus five year or 10 year or something like that. And therefore, you might try to apply the 179 deduction to those items that have the longer lives so that you get more of the benefit in year one. And then the other properties, if it's only three year property, although you don't get the 179 deduction this year, you're gonna get the benefit in three years as opposed to seven years or something like that. So it can actually get somewhat complex uh, when, you, when you hit the cap and try to decide which property you should allocate the 179 to if you have options there. Tip, the amount you can elect to deduct is not affected uh, if you place qualifying property in service in a short tax year, or if you place qualifying property in service for only part of a 12 month tax year. So in other words, you might be saying, and this is often the case with full depreciation and maker's depreciation, because maker's depreciation, as we will see later, is a double declining method, which is a front loaded method. Uh, you would think, well, if I bought the property all at the end of the year, then I'm taking advantage of this half year convention. So, so you would, you could think of the same thing for the, the 179. Do I still get it if I bought all of the property in December, right? Do I get all of the deduction, even though I haven't even held on to it for a month? So tip, the amount you can elect to deduct is, is not affected if you place qualifying property in service in a short tax year, or if you place qualifying property in service for only a part of a 12 month tax year. So caution after you apply the dollar limit to determine the tentative deduction, you must apply the business income limit described later to determine your actual section 179 deduction. Example, in 2023, you bought and placed in service uh, 1,160,000 in machinery and 25,000 circular saw for your business. You elect to deduct 1,135,000 for the machinery and the entire 25,000 for the saw, a total of 1,160,000. This is the maximum amount uh, you can deduct. Your $25,000 deduction for the saw completely recovers its cost. Your basis for the depreciation is zero. The basis in the pro in the depreciation of your machinery is twenty five thousand, 
Uh, you figure this by subtracting your 1135000 Section 179 deduction for the machinery from the 1160000 cost of the machinery. So this is just an example of saying, okay, I have a total deduction that I can take and I have these two pieces of equipment that I can apply the 179 deduction to, but the cap of those two goes over the threshold. So do I want, how do I want to be allocating between these two? And you can see you can kind of choose. What it doesn't give you in this example is the rationale as to why you might do it that way versus another way. And one reason you might do it that way versus another way is because of the relative useful lives of the pieces of property. In other words, the one that you're not going to fully take the 179 deduction on, you would like to depreciate over as short a time frame as possible. So you might try to choose a piece of property that has a shorter uh, time frame, like a three year versus a five year versus a seven year. Uh, with the makers. Situations affecting dollar limit. Under certain circumstances, the general dollar limit on the Section 179 deduction may be reduced or increased, or there may be additional dollar limits. The general dollar limit is affected by any of the following situation. The cost of your, 170, of your Section 179 property uh, placed in service exceeds $2,890,000. So now we, we saw that we had the limit that we can't claim the 179 uh, over the dollar limit that we saw here. Uh, well, here's the dollar limit, 1,160. But we also have this other limit, which is like a like kind of like a phase out limit. So the cost of your section 179 property placed in service exceeds 2 million. 890,000, you placed in service a sport utility or certain other vehicle. So there's that vehicle thing coming up again. So you are married filing a joint or uh, joint or separate return. And so we have certain situations that could cause issued with married situations, which we touched on separate married filing separate is always going to be a point of contention for many items uh, that could cause problems with certain deductions and limitations. So costs exceeding 2,890,000. So if the cost of your qualifying section 179 property placed in service in, uh, in a year is more than 2,890,000, you must generally reduce the dollar limit, but not below zero by the amount of the cost over the 2,890,000. So this is getting a little bit confusing, but remember, the idea is that we can only take so much 179 deduction, but then if your dollar limit goes over this amount, that amount that you could take is going to basically go down. So in other words, so if the cost of your section 179 property placed in service during 2023 is $4,050,000 or more, you cannot take, uh, take a section 179 deduction. So we have to be fairly careful in terms of the range if we're on these upper ranges so that we can kind of maximize our 179 deduction and not just think about the cap, but we also have to think about that kind of phase out if we have a, a whole lot of machinery and equipment. So in 2023, Jane Ash placed in service machinery costing 2,940,000. So this cost is $50,000 more than the 2,890,000. So Jane must reduce the dollar limit to 1,160,000. In other words, the dollar limit, if she was if she was under the threshold, the dollar limit would only be 1,160 that she would be able to take. But now because we have a lot more, we're over that 2,890, we can actually only take the 1,160 minus the 50,000 or 1,110,000 ,000 of the section 179. So sport utility and certain other vehicles. So here we get into once again, the vehicle situation. You cannot elect to expense more than 28,900 of the cost of any heavy sport utility vehicle, an SUV and certain other vehicles placed in service in tax years beginning in 2023. So the SUV is another kind of notorious issue with taxes because there's questions as to whether it's going to be a work-related truck or if it's 
a fun, an SUV to you know that's more family related that you know and 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 there was issues with that. So uh, this rule applies to any four wheel vehicle primarily designed or used to carry passengers over public streets, roads, or highways that is rated at more than six thousand pounds gross vehicle weight and not more than fourteen thousand pounds gross vehicle weight. So this is one of those areas where the tax code did something kind of funny to try to incentivize people that kind of backfired. And that was, they said, well, if it's if it's uh, basically a car or an automobile that weighs more than 6,000 pounds, we're going to assume that it's for work purposes because that would generally be the case. But then, of course, what happened is people bought SUVs for kind of personal use that also weighed over 6,000 pounds. And manufacturers actually has an incentive to make the cars heavier uh, for that reason, which obviously is not what you would want to do from the incentive side of things when they're trying to do this environmental thing and whatnot. You would think you'd want lighter cars <laughs> that would take less gas and so on. So we have this whole kind of situation with the 6,000 pound thing. However, so the $28,900 limit does not apply to any uh, de uh, designed to seat more than nine passenger behind the driver's seat. So in that case, you would think it's not really a passenger for a family, unless it's a large family, right? Because you, so that's, that's why you, it would justify a larger deduction because you wouldn't think most people would buy something that big, like a bus, right? Uh, equipment with a cargo area, uh, either open or enclosed by a cap of at least six feet in interior length that is not readily accessible from the passenger compartment. So again, that would pretty much clearly define it as a work vehicle and not a personal. So that has an in integral uh, enclosure fully enclosing the driver compartment and load carrying uh, device does not have seating uh, rearward of the driver's seat and has no body section protruding from the 30 inches ahead of the leading edge of the windshield. So that gets somewhat technical, but again, you would think that would indicate it more as not a personal thing, but a business thing. Married individuals. So if you are married, how you figure your section 179 deduction depends on whether you file jointly or separately. So we always have this issue of being able to file either married filing joint, married filing separate. It's usually beneficial to file married filing joint. Otherwise, you could run into uh, into situations. So if you file a joint return, you and your spouse are treated as one taxpayer in determining any deduction to the dollar limit, regardless of which of you purchased the property or placed it in service so we would think then if you're married then you're like one entity so you would think that uh, that uh, the dollar limit would be applied to that entity of the married return so if you and your spouse file separate returns you are treated as one taxpayer for the dollar limit including the reduction for costs over two million eight hundred and ninety thousand you must allocate the dollar limit after any reduction between the between you equally unless you both elect a different allocation. So if the passengers elected by each of you do not total uh, 100%, 50% will be allocated to each of you. So that's the general idea. Let's look at an example. All right, you are married. Uh, you and your spouse file separate returns. You bought and placed in service 2,890,000 of qualified farm machinery in 2023. Your spouse has a separate business and bought and placed in service 300,000 of qualified business equipment. Your combined dollar limit is 860,000. This is because you and your spouse must figure the limit as if you were one taxpayer uh, you reduce the $1,160,000 limit by the $300,000 excess of your costs over the $2,890,000. You, uh, uh, you elect to allocate the $860,000 limit as follows. So 100, I mean, sorry, 817,000, which is uh, 860,000 times 95% to your machinery, 43,000, which is that's 860,000 times 5%. Notice the percentages add up to 100% here, to your spouse's equipment. 
So if you did not make an election to allocate your costs in this way, you and your spouse would have to allocate 430000 which is a 50-50 split, to each of you. So joint returns after filing separate returns. If you and your spouse elect to amend your separate returns by filing a joint return after the due date for filing your return, the dollar limit on the joint return is the lesser of the following amounts. The dollar limit after reduction for any cost of Section 179 property over $2,890,000. The total cost of Section 179 property you and your spouse uh, elected to expense on your separate returns. Example, so the facts are the same as in the previous example, except uh, that you elect to deduct 300000 of the cost of Section 179 property on your separate returns and your spouse elected to deduct 20000 After the due date of your returns, you and your spouse file joint returns. So now you said, okay, we filed separately and now we're going to file amend it and file it joint. So the dollar limit of the section 179 deduction is 320,000 because that's the le that is the lesser of the following amounts. Uh, 860,000, the dollar limit less the cost of section 179 property over the 2,890,000, 320,000, the total you and your spouse elected to expense on your separate returns. So in other words, be a little bit careful there, of course, with the primary election, because in this case, they locked in the 320000 uh, that they couldn't go back and amend generally is the general idea here because of this, this uh, limitation on how much you can deduct in that amended kind of situation. So with depreciation, you, you would like to use the principle of measure twice, cut once. In other words, get it right the first time. It's not one of those things you want to tinker with to try to, to try to dial it down to get it right. Because once you make the election, once you have it put down, once you've made the plan, you need to be consistent with the same kind of depreciation uh, going forward in time. Therefore, you'd like to have it right up front. So then we have uh, the business income limit. So the total cost you can deduct each year after you apply the dollar limit is limited to the taxable income from the from the active conduct of any trade or business during the year. Generally, you are considered to actively conduct a trade or business if you meaningfully participate in the management or operations of the trade or business. Any cost not deducted in year one under section 179 because uh, this limit can be carried to next year. So special rules apply to a deduction of qualified 179 real property that is placed in service by you in tax years beginning before 2016 and disallowed because of the business income limit. So see special rules for qualified 179 real property under carryover and disallowed deduction. So if you're not allowed the 179 deduction, then the question would come up, well, do, am I, do I lose the 179 deduction completely or can I carry it backwards or basically carry it forward? Or do, do I lose it from a 179 deduction standpoint and then possibly have to default everything to be depreciated under the makers or some of the questions that could come up there. So taxable income in generally, in general, figuring taxable income for this purpose by totaling the net income and losses from all trades and businesses you actively conducted during the year, net income or loss from a trade or business includes the following items. So you have the section 1231 gains or losses, interest from working capital of your trade or business, wages, salaries, tips, or other pay earned as an employee. For information about section 1231 gains and losses, see chapter three of publication 544. In addition, figuring taxable income without regard to any of the following. So you have the section, the, the section 179 deduction, the self-employment tax deduction, any net operating loss carry over or carry back, any unreimbursed employee business expenses. So whenever we have these income limitations and so on and so forth, you get the general idea of it, but then it actually can get somewhat technically complicated 
because then they start at a starting point and then say these are certain things that would be included or not included so that we can be more precise. Obviously, software helps with those types of calculations. Two different taxable income limits. In addition to the business income limit for your Section 179 deduction, you may have a taxable income limit for some other deductions. You may have to figure the limit for these other deductions taking into account the Section 179 deduction. If so, complete the following steps. Step one, uh, action. One, fi figure step in the action. Step one. Figure taxable income without the Section 179 deduction or the other deduction. Two, figure a hypothetical Section 179 deduction using the taxable income figured in step one. Step three, figure the hypothetical Section 179 deduction figured in step two from the taxable income figured in step one. Step four, figure a hypothetical amount for the other deduction using the amount figured in step three as taxable income. Step five, subtract the hypothetical other deduction figured in step four from the taxable income figured in step one. Step six, Figure your actual Section 179 deduction using the taxable income figured in Step 5. Step 7. Subtract your actual Section 179 deduction figured in Step 6 from the taxable income figured in Step 1. And finally, Step 8. Figure your capital other deduction using the taxable income figured in Step 7. Now, obviously, what are you going to do in practice? You're going to use tax software, right? right? You're going to use tax software, but... You're still going to obviously the tax software should help you to 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 do these calculations and then you'd want to go back into that and double and basically get the idea and be able to verify to some extent or another that you understand what is happening. So one, the tax software, you can verify that you did the data input properly and didn't override anything and whatnot. And two, so that you can explain at least the gist of what is happening to someone that's gonna have questions uh, about the tax preparation, whether that be a client or some, in the event of an audit or something. Example, so on February 1st, 2023, the XYZ Corporation purchased and placed in service qualified Section 179 property that cost 1,160,000. It elects to expense the entire 1,160,000 cost under Section 179. In June, the corporation gave a charitable contribution of $10,000. A corporation's limit on the charitable contribution is figured after subtracting any Section 179 deduction. So the business income limit for Section 179 deduction is figured after subtracting any allowable charitable contributions. So XYZ's taxable income figured without the Section 179 deduction or the deduction for charitable contributions is 1,180,000. XYZ figures its Section 179 deduction and its deduction for charitable contributions as follows. Step one. Taxable income figured without either deduction is 1,180,000. Step two, using 1,180,000 as taxable income, XYZ's hypothetical section 179 deduction is 1,160,000 because that's the cap. Step three, 20,000, which is the 1,180,000 minus 1,160,000. Step four, Using 20000 from step three as taxable income, XYZ's hypothetical charitable contribution limited to 10% of taxable income is 2000 Step five, 1178000 which is 1180000 minus that 2000 Step six, using the 1178000 from step five as taxable income, XYZ figures the actual section 179 deduction because the taxable income is, is at least 1160000 XYZ can take a 1160000 section 179 deduction. Step seven, 20,000, which is the 1,180,000 minus the 1,160,000. And then step eight, finally, using the $20,000 from step seven as taxable income, XYZ's actual charitable contribution limited to 10% of taxable income is 2,000. Okay, and tax software helps. <laughs> so carryover of disallowed deduction. 
So you can carry over the, uh, the unlimited number of uh, two for an unlimited number of years, the cost of any qualified Section 179 real property that you placed in service in tax years beginning after 2015 and that you elected to expense but were unable to deduct because of the business income limit. So again, question, well, if I don't get the 179 upfront deduction, what happens? Do I get to carry it back? Possibly not in this case. Do I get to carry it forward? Possibly get to carry it forward. Or do I get to do I have to eliminate and just lose the 179 deduction and then depreciate the basis using the default maker's depreciation, right? Which means you wouldn't be able to get as big of a benefit typically if you had income in the following year that you can take the 179 deduction against. Okay. So this, this, this disallowed deduction amount is shown on line 13 of form 4562. Uh, you use the amount you carry over to determine your section 179 deduction in the next year. Enter that amount on line 10 uh, of your form 4562 for the next year. If you place more than one property in service in a year, you can select the properties for which all or a part of the costs will be carried forward, your selections must be shown in your books and records. For this purpose, treat section 179 costs alloc allocated from a partnership or an S corporation as one item of section 179 property. If you do not make a selection, the total carryover will be allocated equally among the properties you elect to expense for the year. So again, we have this kind of allocation situation method uh, that could, again, result in more complicated tax planning than you might think at first glance because of the different types of property that 179 might be allocated to and the useful lives of those property if we don't take 179 deduction because we might then be able to deduct them using makers over different lengths of years, three, five, seven, ten, 10, for example, and the, the shorter lived ones are the shorter the life or the sooner we get the depreciation, usually the better. So if costs from, uh, from more than one year are carried forward to a subsequent year in which only part of the total carryover can be deducted, you must deduct the costs being carried forward from the earliest year. All right, special rules for qualified section 179 real property. You can carry over to 2024 a 2023 deduction attributable to qualified section 179 real property that you placed in service during the tax year and that you elected to expense but were unable to take because of the business income limitation. See carry over of disallowed deduction earlier. Thus, the amount of any section uh, any 2023 disallowed section 179 expense deduction attributable to the qualified section 179 real property will be reported on line 13 of form 4562. Again, software helps with carryovers. So partnership and partners, the section 179 deduction limits apply both to partnerships and to each partner. The partnership discernment determines its section 179 deduction subject to the limits. Uh, it then allocates the deduction among its partners. So in other words, we're mainly looking at sole proprietor schedule C businesses. But what if you have a partnership? Well, then you have to file a separate return, even though it's a flow through entity. And you would think then these limitations would be applicable at the partnership level be because that's the, that's the business entity but also then it's gonna flow through in the form of K-1s to the separate tax returns for the individuals where, again, you might have separate limitations. Once another time here, again, where tax software is useful with these items. So each partner adds the amount allocated from partnerships shown on schedule K-1, that's the flow through document coming from the form 1065 to the individual partners tax returns two or more partners right partner share of income deductions credits etc to their non-partnership section 179 costs and then applies the dollar limit to this total to determine any reduction in the dollar limit for costs over two million eight hundred and ninety thousand the partner does not include any of the cost of section 179 property placed in service by the partnership after the dollar limit reduced 
for any non-partnership Section 179 costs over $2,890,000 is applied. Any remaining cost of the partnership and non-partnership Section 179 property is subject to the business income limit. Partnerships taxable income. For purposes of the business income limit, figuring the partnership's taxable income by adding together the net income and losses from all trades or businesses actively conducted by the partnership during the year. See the instructions for Form 1065 for information on how to figure partnership net income. A little bit outside the scope of what we're doing here, mainly focusing on the Schedule C. However, figure taxable income without regard to credits, tax exempt income, the section 179 deduction and guaranteed payment under section 707C of the Internal Revenue Code. Partner's share of partnership taxable income. For purposes of business income limit, the taxable income of a partner engaged in the active conduct of one or more of the partnership's trades or business includes their alloc allocable share of taxable income derived from the partnership's active conduct of any trade or business. So typically, if you're a partner, you have two or more partners that are part of a partnership, then it's not just going to be a 50-50 or whatever, one-third, one-third, one-third. If there's three partners allocation, unless you don't elect any other allocation or choose that allocation because you might choose a different type of allocation of income according to the partnership uh, agreement, which of course would be something done on the partnership level which would then flow through generally with the k-1s to the partners 1040 tax returns <laughs>